Welcome back to another AP Chemistry lesson. Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug. And in this lesson, as you can see, we're learning the basics of thermodynamics in AP Chemistry this time. Now, when we say thermodynamics, this is one of the very fundamental parts of learning about chemical reactions. Chemical reactions are a very big topic in AP Chemistry, in case you haven't already noticed that. Later on in this course, we're going to learn about how fast a reaction goes. That's what we call chemical kinetics. We'll spend some time learning about that toward the end of this course. Also, there's a, a very large topic called equilibrium, and that's basically telling us to what extent a reaction goes. Does the reaction go 100% to completion, or do only 50% of the of the reactants turn into products? You know that type of thing. That's equilibrium. Well, in this section, thermodynamics, we're learning. Is a reaction even going to happen at all? And if it does or does not, why is that the case? What are the forces that drive reactions? That's what thermodynamics is all about. So when we say thermodynamics, it's all about energy changes in natural processes. And we can talk about thermodynamics uh, in great detail, we can take entire college courses, graduate level college courses about thermodynamics, both in chemistry and in physics. But in this uh, course, AP Chemistry, we're just barely going to scratch the surface. And so we'll, we'll be learning about uh, energy as it relates to chemical processes. Now, when we talk about energy and heat, in the SI framework of measurement, they're both measured in joules. And if we have a lot of joules, then it's convenient to talk about kilojoules. So you'll hear us use joules and kilojoules in this course. Now, that's not the only unit. There's another unit that you're probably familiar with called calories. We can also, also measure uh, energy in calories. Uh, years ago, that was the most common uh, unit used. Uh, we can convert from calories to joules very easily one calorie is 4.18 joules. So we have these calories. Now, you're probably familiar with calories such as in food, in candy bars, in, in anything that you eat or drink. Well, the calories that you, that you actually see on a food label are 1,000 of these, these calories that we're talking about here. So if you eat a candy bar that says it has 200 calories, it actually has 200,000 calories in it. The other calories that are on a food label we sometimes call nutritional calories. So we can convert them that way. Now, let's talk about how energy is distributed as we raise the temperature of something. The way that we do that is by something called a, a Boltzmann distribution curve, and it looks something like this. Here we have the same sample of matter that we've just heated up. And so what we have here is, is we'll start on the left side with this sample of matter at 100 kelvins, which is really, really cold, as you probably know. And notice that the velocity is pushed very far over here to the left. So that tells us that almost all of your molecules are not moving very fast. Now, there are some molecules that are moving a little bit faster than others. You know, they may be fast, moving fast enough to even uh, evaporate or escape into the gas phase, you know, the ones over here on the right side. But notice what happens as we go to the right. As we uh, shove over to the right, as, as you have higher temperatures, you know, more molecules are going to have a greater velocity, and thus they're going to have greater kinetic energy. So at 200 kelvins, notice that we have... Uh, more molecules that have a higher velocity. So, you know, more of those molecules will be able to evaporate and escape the liquid, perhaps turn into a, to a gas, as we can see there. As we move to the right at 500 kelvins, notice that we have even more molecules that are shoved farther to the right over here. And that tells us that uh, those molecules have more velocity. They're moving faster and faster and faster, and more of them can jump out into the gas phase. And look here at 1,000 kelvins that we actually have, you know, almost all of them are above the threshold that they were at 100 kelvins. And so we're going to have a lot of evaporation, a lot of boiling possibly taking place at this higher temperature. Now, Question, looking at the Boltzmann curve, why is the area underneath each of the curves the same? Think about that. Well, hopefully you can see that it's the same sample of matter. So we have the same number of molecules, and so we're going to have the same area underneath the curves. 
Now, let's see if we can interpolate something here. What might this curve look like at 750 kelvins? You know, we have 100, we have 200, 500, and 1,000 kelvins. Well, what it's going to look like, it's going to be somewhere in between the 500 and 1,000. Now, I'm not very good at actually uh, drawing this, but let's just do our best here. I'm going to do my best. And we know that you'll have the same area underneath the curve. It's going to taper off certainly more quickly than it would at 1,000. So it's going to maybe look something like, like this. Whoops, maybe something like that. So that might be our 750 Kelvin curve. Notice it's shoved farther to the right as the temperature goes up. Now let's take a look at some terms that we've used before, heat and temperature. Now, in common usage in your day-to-day -day life, you might think heat and temperature are the same thing. Actually, they're not. They are related to each other. When we talk about temperature, that is an actual numerical measure of the average kinetic energy in the molecules of a material. So, average kinetic energy of the molecules. That's just a fancy way of saying temperature. So sometimes on a test or on even the AP exam, they'll ask a question like, which of these has the greater average kinetic energy? And it's just asking which of these has the greater temperature. That's all that that question is asking. So the average kinetic energy is just a fancy word for temperature when you see that on a homework assignment or, or on a quiz or something. Now, in the SI framework, we measure average kinetic energy or temperature in kelvins. Now that's the most convenient unit because the kelvins, the kelvin temperature is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So that means that if you see the temperature in kelvins uh, doubling, you know that the average kinetic energy of the molecules is also a doubling as well. So that's why it's really convenient to use kelvins. Now we can use degrees Celsius. That's fine. We can use degrees Fahrenheit if we really want to. But we would really have to convert to kelvins in order to see how uh, kinetic energy relates to temperature. That's, so that's why we, we tend to use kelvins here. On the other hand, heat. Heat is the form of energy that's transferred between two systems at different temperatures. We'll talk about what that means here in just a minute. Sometimes it's called thermal energy. Uh, there are some people who don't like the word heat for some reason, so they use thermal energy. In AP Chemistry, we are just fine with using the word heat. And like I said, in the SI framework, we measure heat in joules. So notice, temperature and heat, they're similar, but they're measured in different units. Temperature is kelvins. Heat is joules, so be aware of that. Now let's illustrate how heat can be transferred. Let's imagine here that we have a nice hot bowl of soup. So you can see the soup, you know, got a little garnish there on the side, and, and that hot soup looks good on a nice cold day. So what is going to happen to that soup? Well, let's imagine that we have soup, and that, that's pretty hot soup. It's about 360 kelvins, which is it's pretty hot if you want to calculate that. That's about the temperature of a nice hot bowl of soup. And the surrounding air that's around that soup is much cooler. It's probably about 295 kelvins. That's about room temperature most of the time. Now, what's going to happen to the temperature of that soup if you don't eat it and just leave it out there on the table? Well, I think you know that the temperature of that soup, especially if you leave it out for several hours, like 10 hours, it's going to drop significantly. The temperature of that soup is going to drop, and let's say it drops to you know pretty close to room temperature, about 296 kelvins. So the, the temperature of that soup dropped significantly. Now, that means that the heat had to go somewhere. That thermal energy had to be transferred, because heat doesn't just disappear. It has to go somewhere. So the question is, where did that heat, where did that thermal energy go? Well, it had to go to the surroundings, to the surrounding air. And so as a result, the temperature of the surrounding air goes up. Now, it doesn't go up very much because there's a lot of air in the room and there's not a whole lot of soup in the bowl. So maybe that surrounding air temperature in that room goes up by, oh, let's say one Kelvin, you know, one degree or so Celsius. That's not very much, but if you think about how big the room is and how small the bowl of soup is, you know, that's probably a pretty significant amount. But you can see that the heat is transferred. It's never destroyed. It's never created. It's just transferred. So it's transferred from the soup to the surrounding air. 
And that's what happens to heat. It gets transferred. Now, when we talk about the surroundings and the, the system, the soup in this case, the system is specifically talking about the atoms and the molecules and the ions that are actually participating in a chemical or physical process. That means that in a chemical reaction, we're talking about the things that actually appear in the chemical equation. Okay, They're actually going to be written down. Uh, maybe the catalyst, if you have one of those. That's the system. Okay. Now, the surroundings would be everything else in the universe. So if we're talking about the bowl of soup, everything else, the air around it, the building it's in, the whole planet Earth, the stars and the galaxies, everything else would be the surroundings. Now, sometimes we forget that that does include the air in the room around a reaction. That's, of course, that is pretty obvious, really. It also includes the beaker in which the reaction is taking place. Sometimes we forget about that. Here's another one that some, some students forget about. The surroundings even include the water in the beaker in the case of an aqueous reaction. So think about that. When you take a thermometer and you stick that into uh, the beaker in a reaction, in aqueous solution, some kind of a net ionic equation, for example, you're not measuring the temperature of the uh, system. You're measuring the temperature of the surroundings. So we have to take that into account whenever we're working with our equations, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, we'll, we'll see how that works. And sometimes we actually have to do a sign change because of that. Now, we're going to be learning about energy transfers in chemical systems in this course. Now, like I said a minute ago, in a chemical reaction, energy is never created nor destroyed. So we're not going to be worrying about you know, energy created or destroyed. It doesn't happen in chemistry. Like we said, energy is uh, transferred. And energy can be converted from one form to another when it's being transferred into or out of a system. And in chemistry, the two types of energy that we are interested in, as far as a chemical system goes, are heat and work. So there's heat and work. Heat is the thermal energy that we talked about, and work is force carried through a distance. So sometimes if you have a chemical reaction and it is actually, maybe it's getting hot and it's causing an increase in pressure inside and it, maybe it causes the a piston or something to go up or to expand, well that's work that's being done when there, a force is being actually is actually causing motion on on something. Now in the next video, we're actually going to learn how to calculate the work. Okay, that's something that we sometimes don't think about in chemical reactions, but we'll talk about how to calculate the work and how to combine that with heat to learn the total uh, internal energy change in a chemical process. I hope you learned something in this video. If you did, please hit that thumbs up button and subscribe if you haven't already uh, joined our, our, our army of subscribers here in my AP Chemistry videos. Uh, I'm Jeremy Krug. I've been teaching AP Chemistry for over 20 years and hope you learned something today. Hope to see you again on my channel where we can learn some more chemistry together. Some more